Okay, let's get started. For this week, we're going to continue our series of what can we learn from. And I think today we have an incredible opportunity to concentrate on an amazing artist, Matt Bollinger. I've been a big fan of Matt's work for years now. I think he is a fantastic drafts person. I think he's an incredible animator. And of course, I think he's a wonderful painter. And even though I'm technically amazed by what he does, I think he excels at formal qualities in drawing, in animation, and in painting. What drives me most towards his work is his narrative, but also his ability to portray something that is incredibly difficult, which in my mind is Americana. It's really, really tough to historically find painters that can encompass what America, what American painting is. I think that if you go back to abstract expressionism, there was this hunger in America. There was this yearning in America to finally have an artist that would represent what the country would mean. And that's why figures like Jackson Pollock were born. It was almost like a sort of perfect storm, but it had to do with America trying to finally find their own values and portray them towards the world. But before Pollock, there were artists that were speaking about what the melting pot of American culture was. And it was pretty amazing to see how American identity was growing through painting. So in my mind, what the great Ashcan school did with uh, John Sloan, George Bellows, for example, was to show this kind of underbelly of what the post-migrant story of America was starting to look like. And after that, I think the greatest American painter, which was Edward Hopper, was not only able to generate a narrative from these values that were already set, but was also able to imbue them with this magical quality that ultimately gave Hopper this ability to display America as if it was on stage and give it this theatrical nature. So if you think of Matt Bollinger's work as following that wonderful lineage, you know, John Sloan, George Bellows, Edward Hopper, you're really lucky to find in him an artist that is able to portray what I think nowadays could be a kind of post-COVID or maybe even before that, but a sort of empty Americana. So what happens when this American dream dies? I think his paintings are just absolutely full of this quiet sense of a past empire, a society that knew itself bigger and has now kind of eroded in many ways. And I think that there's individuality to his paintings. I think the people that are portrayed in his work feel like they're very specific human beings and they do feel connected by this Americanness. But there also seems to be a void between human beings. There, there seems to be a chasm, a precipice between human beings that does not enable a relationship between them. That is sounding quite melancholic, but I think that that is at the core of Matt's work. And he's an absolute genius at it. When I was thinking about understanding him as an artist that we could reflect upon for this series, I was noticing that it was going to be almost impossible to follow the narrative that has to do with American culture. Because I am American. I wouldn't consider myself as an American painter. I don't think I've understood myself as an American or I've lived enough in the U.S. to see myself as somebody who can understand the values and understand the history and understand the culture and is able to mix all of those ingredients and output them in a painting? I don't think so. Even though I struggle with myself being a Colombian painter, whatever that means, I am far more in tune with my Colombianness than I am with the fact that I was born and lived in the U.S. So I think it would be disingenuous of me to say that there is a narrative there in Matt's work that I can learn from because it doesn't quite feel like my own history. When I look at his paintings, I often feel like I am a viewer, like I am one of these people that is sitting in the theater looking at the stage where all this American drama is happening. So all these things that I'm moved by in his work, I, I don't quite understand it as my own history. I can recognize it, but there is a space between the feelings that are being portrayed and where they're born from, and my own interaction. In that sense, in the narrative sense, I don't think he's an artist that I can truly use 
as a trampoline to understand my own nature as an American citizen. I don't think I can. I would be grasping at straws if I were doing that. But I do think that as what happens with great painters, Matt's work is not really directed towards an American audience. You know, in the same way I'm moved by John Sloan's work or I'm moved by Edward Hopper's work, and God knows that I am incredibly moved by Edward Hopper. I think that when you peel that layer of this new Americana, this post-COVID Americana, you realize that he is painting human beings and human stories. And at their core, they are universal. So I think that the, the sentiment behind them, I think that the human feelings of isolation that are being portrayed, of these kind of empty looks and empty stares, I think that those belong to all of us human beings and we all have the ability to interact with them. So in that sense, I do think that he is a great painter because he is speaking about his own stories, but he's doing it in a way in which everyone can access them. And when you open yourself to be able to be part of these stories, again, to the core of these stories, you realize that, yes, you can very much so be completely moved by them. I do think he's one of the great contemporary figurative painters. I think his career is going to be amazing. It already is. He's already made an enormous impact on the uh, contemporary figurative painting scene. So I think it's a wonderful opportunity to take the time and look at more formal qualities of his work and say, well, as a painter, what can I learn from his work? You know, what is he doing that is enabling him to portray so effectively those feelings, to interpret them in painting in such a powerful way? And one thing that I think I recognized almost immediately was simplicity. And I know this is kind of weird because his paintings are sometimes these prism-like geometries that speak about different light sources. Sometimes they are artificial, high-chroma light sources and how they are illuminating the figure. You know, this is also why I was describing his work as very stage-like. These look like production lights in a way. This looked like a director of photography was lighting these. Very cinematic in many ways. But he breaks the picture plane because it's not even about form many times in ways that are very reminiscent of more abstract work, of more cubist work, let's say. So light, yes, functions as light because at times it is describing three-dimensionality of form. But at other times, it's very beautiful how as as light, as the concept of light sort of traverses the picture plane or advances through the picture plane, it becomes more and more abstract. It doesn't really have to abide by rules of form. It doesn't really have to travel through it. It's not interested in describing three-dimensionality. It's more about space, like a checkerboard space. It's providing you with rhythms to just jump from one form to another. And eventually it just becomes like this powerful device so that you can carry on the reading of this narrative through the painting. I think that those are the formal qualities that are most powerful of his work. I mean, there is, yes, a highly stylized drawing that is absolutely wonderful, that suits the tone of what he's trying to communicate perfectly. And yes, you know, in terms of chromatic choices, he is absolutely brilliant. He knows exactly what he's doing when generating color relationships, be it contrast by complementaries or controlling the values within his work. But as I was saying, what I was immediately drawn to is just the compactness of his work. It really, really feels tight, even though there can be somewhat dissonant accents of saturation or relative or apparent saturation better. I think that there's a very organized feeling of the colors that are being used. So that's what immediately prompted me to think, okay, this is kind of reminiscent of when we did a series of paintings where I was trying to use like a very limited number of pre-mixed colors. And I think when I was doing that series of videos, I was just thinking of formal qualities. But I think what I missed in that week was understanding the narrative that could accompany. And I'm not speaking about a narrative as in the underlying message that a painting can hold, but the narrative that can be present through the color choices, which I think that's where Matt is an absolute genius at doing those sort of things. So I'm really grateful that this opportunity to reflect upon Matt's work gave me a chance to almost like go back to those series of paintings where we were pre-mixing some limited colors and take on that exercise once again, but with a deeper understanding of what I was doing. So technically, what I did was something that was very simple, 
but something that proved to be very powerful and conditioning, though, for the image. So when I looked at the image that I was going to paint, I made some choices right from the start, and I had an idea of what I wanted to say. Now, this is fun for me because the color choices already spoke about something that was incredibly far from the nature of the lighting condition that was part of my reference. So right from the start, I realized, yes, I'm going to divorce myself from the information that is in my reference, and I'm going to try to construct a painting just based on what I want to say with this story of color. That is something that can be very liberating. When you realize that your efforts are not just subjected to the hard work of being faithful to nature, to trying to capture nature's essence and interpret that through painting. So it's not just about echoing nature, but it's understanding nature as a starting point, understanding nature as a wonderful source, if not the best source that you could ever find in this universe. When you notice that you have the ability to take all that information that is in nature and bend it to your own will, it can be overwhelming. It can crush you because that is an enormous weight. I mean, think about the weight of infinite possibilities upon your shoulders. I think that's crippling. And I think that that's one of the reasons many people find safety, even though it requires an enormous amount of hard work and discipline to try to learn how to be faithful to nature. There's a lot of people that find in being a naturalist painter something that is very safe because ultimately you're trying to sometimes enhance and yes, sure, interpret what nature is providing you. But the ultimate goal is to share an experience with the viewer that is familiar to them. You're not trying to do something that would present to them a separate world. So what I noticed is that when conditions are finite and when the parameters are very, very tight, are very compact, like what I described in Matt's work, it makes it more digestible. And I think it also makes the exercise just a little bit more simple for your brain. In what sense? Well, in the sense that you only have a few options to solve things. There's no running to other colors that are outside of those pre-mixed colors. There is, yes, the yearning. There is the longing of wishing that you would have made better choices when you pre-mixed those colors. But I think the idea is not to yearn for those things that lie outside the palette. I think that there's a sort of acceptance that is necessary when looking at these swatches of color, these little mounds of color that you've already pre-mixed. There is something quite peaceful about thinking, my painting lies in here. And it's not because you've made these incredibly wise choices when you pre-mix those colors, but it's because you already made those choices. And it's kind of interesting to put yourself in that place where there are no more options. You can question if those are the best options, but that's kind of pointless because those are the options that you have and there's nothing more there. So you can convince yourself that you are sadly going to be making a lesser painting because you didn't have the right variables to start with. Or you can immediately say, I'm going to embrace the colors that are there. I mean, these were my choices. So um, I did have a level of control, but these are limited choices. And I'm not very sure if they were the best choices when I pre-mixed them, but I'm going to trust them. I'm going to trust that everything that I need to make a picture is right there. And there's something, again, in there that gives you an incredible amount of peace because you don't have to search any further. You don't. It's already there. So all you have to do now is use these choices and use them wisely. And I think as soon as you go through that moment of acceptance, you realize, okay, I need to organize my painting in a very simple, direct way. So you have to go back to very simple color theory in the sense that it's about color relationships and be very intelligent about it because the way in which you dispose these colors within the picture plane, the way in which you organize relationships and choreographies and rhythms in which these colors can start to gain roles, they can start to speak about form and light, but they also bear their abstractness. They are also proud to be abstract because even though you're going to try to speak about light or midtone or shade, it's kind of going to be impossible to fully articulate what three-dimensionality would mean with those very limited options. So 
you're very conscious that what you're doing is interpretation. And you're very conscious that what you're doing is an organization of color shapes and forms in a picture plane. And I don't think I had realized how powerful that is when I did that series of paintings a while back. I think it was a very cool discovery to be hyper-conscious about it during this week. And the reason that I think I was able to make that connection is that I chose to be guided by Matt's work. I mean, it does really speak about how relevant having a guide is when you are going through a learning process. And I consider that every single painting that we do is a learning process, is a chance to learn something that you didn't know about, is a chance to have an experience that you hadn't had before, and it's an opportunity of growth and self-examination. So every single painting is that. It doesn't matter where you are in your development as a painter, how many years of experience you have. Every single painting can become that. But that journey is a little bit easier when it's done with the company of a great, great painter. And I think in this case, Matt was a fantastic guiding light. I always pride myself in believing that I understand the kind of core values of painting Simple is always better is one of those fundamental things that they teach you about before you begin to paint. Go big before you go small. In very traditional educational settings, that's why they tell you to squint, to separate big masses of light and shadow when you're working from life. There's always like this idea, there's always like this notion that ties the concept of wholeness with the concept of the essence of nature. If you understand the underlying rules, the governing rules of what you're looking at, you can then break those big laws into smaller sections, into smaller forms, and only then speak about the specificities regarding what you're trying to portray. So I always thought that I was a painter that understood how relevant it is to teach your brain to see bigness, to see wholeness, to see unity. But these exercises showed to me that... That little bit of resistance that I encounter when I'm looking at these pre-mixed choices that I myself did. So there was that level of control, but also that level of them being a sort of bet. Because I didn't really know if those were the choices that would make a powerful painting. I'm not a painter that pre-mixes color. Most of the time, like 99% of my paintings happen with an open palette and open mixing. So it's very hard for me to envision a painting by pre-mixing these limited options. So it does feel like a blind bet to me, as, as strange as that sounds, but it really, really put me in a place where I had to go back to my fundamentals, go back to basics and say, what is my painting about and how do I organize the painting based on the few choices that I have? And again, be intelligent about it. This is about composing with color. It was truly exciting. It's a simple painting, but it was really cool how my gaze turned towards my painting. So usually when you're working from life or from reference, you are constantly measuring what you interpreted through paint with what the original information was. So you're going back and forth from your photo to your painting, from the model to your painting, from nature to your painting. You're just constantly gauging your decision making. And the wonderful thing is you have nature in front of you or an imprint of nature in front of you to guide you through that process. So you can always tell yourself, well, I was trying to go for that color and I interpret it this way in my palette. And when I put it down, I realized, no, it was a little high chroma. It was a little too dark. That was not the right hue. That was not the right temperature. You can always make adjustments, but you can make them only because you have nature as your reference. You have this encyclopedia of information right in front of you that you can always go back to. But what's interesting about turning your gaze towards your painting is that you now don't really look at the photo you're painting from. You are looking at your painting and you're looking at your painting's demands and you're adjusting your painting based on those demands and based on your intent, you know, because now you are feeling that this painting is happening because you are making choices. And it's not because you're making choices so you can get closer to nature. It's because you have made in this case, prior choices, but you are sticking to those choices and organizing them, disposing them in a way in which you think they can tell a powerful story. So it's really wonderful to notice how 
that shift becomes real, how your brain starts to separate itself from that dependence of the information that is in a picture and starts relying upon what is happening in a painting. You look at your painting. You reflect upon your painting. You see how your choices make an effect in your painting. I think that putting yourself in that condition makes it very clear that while you're painting, you're creating this painting. With every choice that you're putting down, you are designing this painting that lives in a very separate realm from its origin, from looking at nature, from looking at the model, from looking at your reference photo. So it's really, really interesting how bonding of an experience it is with painting. I was very, very happy to have this opportunity to go back to something that I thought I had understood, but gave me another chance to see it under a different sort of microscope when I was looking at it, accompanied by the work of Matt Bollinger. I think that that's one of the most valuable things about artists and their work, which is that they can prove to be company. The point is never to just paint like Matt. Like I said from the beginning, it was very obvious to me that I can't paint like him, not in a technical way because I don't really draw like him. I don't organize my pictures like him. You know, it was very simple to me to realize that the sentiment behind his paintings, even though there is like an underlying human one that I can access, what I find most beautiful about his work is something that doesn't belong to me. So the point is never to just replicate something that somebody else who is very talented is doing. The point is to say, if you were holding my hand and walking down this path with me, what can you help me do that it's difficult for me. And I think that this was a, a, a wonderful experience for me. A simple one, but just a very, very powerful reminder. So I was very happy about that. So that's going to be it for today. Join us next week for our new iteration of What Can We Learn From? Thank you.